Hey, fellas, hold on a second. Just wait. Calm down. Just calm down, mister. All right. We are ready now. Everyone ready? We may have a Muslim who will come, and I may have him on my stream yard. So good to see you guys. Glory to the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and Jesus' almighty name. Everyone, good to see you. Pro Life, Chloe, Ryan, a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ, Ivan95, Moib, Kia the Great, Adimion, GM Thrust, Ben Yosef, right? Kotir, how you doing, buddy? Christian Tradition, Mark D'Souza, that's right. Emira, all right, good to see you. Ibrahim, Alayhi Salam, Kolb, right? Le Ponto, you're going to be mentioned in this session, Lepanto. So I know you're here every day. God bless all of you. The Triune God flood all of you. Flood your loved ones. Flood me, my my daughters. And His infinite love, compassion, mercy. Glory to the Father. Glory to the Son. Glory to the Holy Spirit. Ahmad Ibrahim alayhi salam. Mopoy Mahal. Joshua Jones. Seminaries in class. I like the name Mopoy Mahal. By the way, Lepanto, I'm going to be mentioning you in a minute. I, I take it as a confirmation that what you sent me was something for me to watch. I didn't get to watch it. Ortho Christos. This guy does a hit and run. He comes and listens, says a comment, and then pulls back. I like you, man. Okay? Tikani said it. Joseph. Joseph, how are you, man? You still alive, man? Okay, I'm proud of you, man. Great is your life's reward in heaven, Joseph. Sister in Christ, how are you? So... Guys, you wait a few minutes to weed out the chaff and muzzle the dogs, the trolls. They gyre. Richard, falafel beat. So hit the like button. Help me to help you. What's up, Ralph? Erasmus. Make sure you're focused and attentive. Share this on your social media platforms. And now pray. Spirit, fill us. So we glorify the Father, the Son, the Lord Jesus, the Holy Spirit. Because when I get into Isaiah 42... It's going to be a super in-depth meat fest. If the Holy Spirit is pleased to work through me, use my mouth as his mouthpiece. You are the teacher. We are disciple. Your disciples, Holy Spirit. Please, we trust in you. Give us the power to know your word, love your word, live out your word for the glory of the Father, the Lord Jesus, your glory, Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. I promise you Isaiah 42 is going to be mind-blowing. The intertextuality, the connections between Isaiah 42, Isaiah 49, Isaiah 53, Isaiah 11, you're going to see how supernatural the Bible is and how it points to the Messiah becoming the servant of Yahuwah, becoming a male child born of a woman, and yet he is God Almighty in the flesh. It's going to be mind-blowing if the Lord wills, if the Holy Spirit is pleased to work through me, because we need the Spirit to teach, and I'd be his mouthpiece. Otherwise, it's going to be a waste of our time. So invite the Spirit to fill us and take over. But now, every time I want to do something, how's the use of other things come up? So I'm just getting ready. So hit the like button, guys. Aaron, how you doing? Well, I know. Wednesdays and Fridays, it's the practice of the ancient church. Brethren, let me exhort you. Wednesdays and Fridays. In the Didache, the Didache, right? Didache. If you read chapters 7 and 8 of the Didache. Now, guys, let me remind you why this is an important document. Why every serious student of the Bible who loves the Lord Jesus Christ must read it. The internal evidence shows it's a first century document. Written anywhere from 50 AD to 70 AD. Early, written during the time of the apostles to their churches. Written when the apostles are still alive. Some of them had been martyred. To their churches. This is a window in how the churches established by the apostles, by the power of the Holy Spirit, Worshipped when they would gather, what they what, what they would do when they gather, the virtues they were supposed to cultivate, the vices and sins they were supposed to hate, how they were to observe the Eucharist, how they were to pray, how they were to get baptized, confessing their sins, and it even condemns abortion. And Lord willing, I'm going to compile quotations from the early church fathers. Quoting the Didache, God willing, hopefully this week, showing you from 1st century, 2nd century, 3rd, 4th century sources, the early church unanimously condemned abortion as murder. There was no debate on this. 
Life begins at conception, and to terminate the life of an unborn child is murder. Unanimous teaching of the church, established by the apostles, by the power of the Holy Spirit, for the glory of Jesus Christ, the household of the living God. Michael Lawler, good to see you. So the Didache is an important document. It is a first century document, brethren. Let me get you the link. It will take you an hour to read it. A fabulous document. Fabulous. Glory to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit for preserving these ancient writings because God of the Bible is almighty. He is real. And he's almighty to preserve his word and his church and to allow us access to that church to know how they worship, what they did, what they didn't do, how they practiced. And the Didache is a book on what we call, now guys, I'm going to sound intelligent here. Okay, I'm going to get you the link, Myra. I mentioned Didache several times. I'm going to try to sound intelligent. So I'm going to use some fancy terms. The Didache, right, is a window into orthopraxy. What's the difference between orthopraxy and orthodoxy? Orthopraxy means correct practice. Orthodoxy means correct doctrine. Many books of the Bible are about correct doctrine. Other books of the Bible are about correct practice. You got to know what to believe and how to live. It's not enough to know what you believe. You must then act upon your belief because faith without works is dead. So can you guys tell me which books of the New Testament are particularly orthopraxy in nature about correct doctrine? Name a book. Some books are about doctrine. Some books are about practice. Some books are a combination of both. Anyone can mention a book that's about orthopraxy, correct doctrine, orthodoxy is correct doctrine, orthopraxy is correct practice, orthopraxy, correct practice, orthodoxy, correct doctrine. Anyone? Give me an idea. James. James. Yep, even Leviticus. Some books will be a combination of both. No, Romans is more on orthodoxy, correct doctrine. James is all about orthopraxy. It's all about doing. It's all about not doing. It's all about proving you're a Christian. Yep, First Timothy is another one that hammers on orthopraxy. So these are technical terms that Christians came up to sound intelligent. Because they couldn't simply say sound practice, sound doctrine. They had to say, Dr. Lycona, which books of the New Testament <clears throat> do you think overwhelmingly points to the greater likelihood that the evidence <clears throat> shows that it's all about orthopraxy? And what other book do you think that the preponderance of the evidence points to being orthodoxy, Dr. Lycona? Well, Dr. Craig, if I was a betting man and I don't bet because that would be sin, that would be a vice. I would say James is all about orthopraxy. Well, I would have to agree with you, Dr. Lycona. You are one massively impressive intellectual. And I'm sensing that it's the left lobe of your brain that works more than the right lobe. What do you think? Well, if I were to ask a psychologist, maybe if he's psycho... You get it? Everyone got it? Yeah. In fact, let me show you where Paul exhorts... And I'm going to give you the document to dedicate in a minute. Paul exhorts Timothy to watch what he believes and how he lives. Watch here. 1 Timothy 4.16. May the Holy Spirit perfect my ability to recall every jot until important scripture perfectly, accurately, and interpret perfectly. Save me from error, confusion, and forgetfulness. And illuminate us to know the word, love the word, live out the word by his power for the glory of Jesus Christ. Here it is. 1 Timothy 4.16. Here is orthodoxy. And orthopraxy. And look what Paul says to Timothy. May the Holy Spirit etch this verse in our souls, spirits, hearts, and minds, and tongues. To practice what we preach. Here it is. 1 Timothy 4.16. Take heed to yourself and to your teaching. Notice. Take heed to yourself. Meaning, take heed to the way you live and what you teach. That's orthodoxy and orthopraxy right there. You guys see it? Take heed to yourself, orthopraxy, watch how you live, and to your teaching, orthodoxy. Hold to that. Help me to help you and stay focused, brethren. 
For by so doing, if you hold to sound practice, sound teaching, orthopraxy, orthodoxy, you will save both yourself and your hearers. Did you see the Im impact? We are a corporate solidarity. We are a body. If we're baptized and born of the Holy Spirit, we are then baptized into Christ. And by the Spirit, we become the spiritual body of Christ. And we are interdependent. Now, what Paul is saying is, what I do and say will affect the members of the body of Jesus Christ, whether I like it or not. So Timothy is saying, because you're a leader who's a, appointing qualified bishops, people look to you and trust in you and believe what you say. So be careful what you say and be careful how you live because what you say and how you live will impact others who look to you as a spiritual guide and will then emulate and imitate you. So you have a great responsibility, Timothy. Great responsibility, Sam Shamoon. People are listening to you and watching you, and they will then emulate you. So you better make sure what you teach is correct, and you're practicing what you preach, and you're not a hypocrite. And may the Holy Spirit save us from hypocrisy. See? That's what he says. Because sadly, we live in a time, that's 1 Timothy 4.16, where people want to be spoon-fed, and they will just trust whatever their leader says without going back, questioning him, and double-checking the context of the verses or whether it's in line with the official teaching of the church or the ancient fathers. You see? Why do you think, my brethren, my heart's appeal to you is, please don't make me more than I am. I know you love me, and I love you guys. I really do. I'm getting to know the regulars, and I can tell you when I see the regulars, joy fills my heart because I love you. I, I mean it. I'm not just saying it. I know the regulars. Sometimes a person shows up once in a while, and I forget. But the regulars, I know who you are. If I stay here and tell you, then we'll be here all day. Ryan is a regular. Lapanto. Sister in Christ has become a regular. Sarah, Michael Lawler, Ortho Christus, Kiri Greece 1978, Deckard, all of you. And I can tell you when I see your names, my heart gets elated because it's a joy for me to be used of the Spirit to serve you because I love you for the sake of the Lord. And I know you love me, you wouldn't be here. But because I want to love the Lord, I have to remind you, don't make me more than I am. I can make mistakes. Where you see I make a mistake, reject it, and pray the Spirit will correct me and remind me where I'm in error, not to repeat it. And when I speak the truth, then act upon it. Because though I may be gifted to teach, I am not more spiritual than you. I am not more Christ-like than you. I pray we all become more Christ-like and more holy. I am a member of the body. I am your brother. If I'm born in the Spirit, and I pray I am. And I need you as you need me, and we all need Jesus. And Jesus doesn't need us, but he's pleased to work through us as his hands and feet and his mouthpiece. So may I never think I'm better than you or higher than you. May that not happen. But I'm going to be honest. If you start attacking me personally and pontificating as if you're holier than me and more righteous than me, then I'm going to go for the juggler and muzzle you because I don't need that. I don't need arrogant snots who think they're pious who think they're more knowledgeable than me sin and judgment than me keep your opinion to yourself because then ss is going to come out you know uh that boxer roy joins when he would get nasty he would say don't bring out rj it's like you know the hulk you remember the series the hulk where dr banner would tell mr mcgee don't get me angry you wouldn't like me when I'm angry because if you get me angry and pain is also regular. God bless you, brother. Good to see you. Two cents as well. Because you're going to bring out SS. If SS comes out, you're in for a world of hurting. Okay? Yeah, I used to love Roy Jones, but you know what broke my heart? Michael Lawler. When Roy Jones got knocked out by Antonio Tarver, my heart was shattered. It was like me seeing Bruce Lee get knocked out. My heart was shattered. Okay. First Timothy 4 16. And I lost all hope in him. And it was never the same. 
Now I can't stand the dude, but I still love Roy Jones. When he got knocked out by Antonio Tarver, my heart was shattered, dude. It was like seeing Bruce Lee get knocked out. Because to this day, sadly, because I have such a love for Bruce Lee, may God purge us of every idolatry. And if it's idolatry, Lord, save me. I beseech you, Lord. I can't imagine Bruce Lee getting beat. Even though he's only five foot, seven and a half inches, 135 pounds. When he died, he was 123. If we're going to be honest and realistic, he's not a god. He could be beat. And a good heavyweight could beat him who had similar skills. But it just doesn't enter my mind because I think the dude is untouchable. Right? So if I were to see Bruce Lee beat, I would be so shattered. I would take, I would purchase a one-way ticket to Mount Athos and I would have the monks chrismate me and baptize me in the Orthodox Church and I would lock myself in that monastery performing contrition and penitence till I die and you never see my face again. If Bruce Lee were to get beat. Okay? Now, if Chuck Norris got beat, I would fly to the Mount, I would go to Lesbo, the island of Lesbos, and I would then sit among the lesbians and preach the gospel to them. <laughs> I'm weird, man. Hey, Danny, good to you. Danny also, I'm realizing he's a regular. He's on my Skype. God bless you, Danny. All right. With that said, let's begin to pray. Oh, by the way. Guess what happened yesterday? Bruce Lee was humble. <laughs> if he's humble, then David Wood is the most spiritual and pious human being the church has ever seen. Bruce Lee and humbleness don't mix. If Bruce Lee was humble, David Wood is the most pious and spiritual Christian the church has ever seen. And you know that's a lie from the pit of hell. If, G if Bruce Lee was humble, then apostate prophet is one of the most handsome creatures of the 21st century. And you know that's a lie from the pit of hell. I've never met two more uglier apologists on the internet. And yet these guys can draw a crowd as ugly as they are and as slow as they are in speaking. Have you seen David when he speaks? You know, I love the brother. He will drag for 15 minutes before he gets to allow the other speaker to chime in. Well, um, you know, this point here, and, and there we go. What do you think of us? Uh, well, yes, uh, David. Yeah, yeah. You know I ain't lying. You know it's the truth, right? Have you seen their weekly shows on Sunday? where they'll be talking about a topic and they'll play a clip, let's say of Richard Dawkins. And then they're and supposed to be, you know, both of them. And then there goes David, uh, you know, with his doing this and, and on and on he goes and you're waiting. Okay. Yeah. Okay. When is Pastor Prophet going to speak? Because I know you didn't bring him for looks. You didn't bring him in order to attract more people to your stream. Cause the longer you look at apostate prophet, the more, you cry out for a tranquilizer. Someone inject you, knock you out for a week to recover from the pain. So, yes, AP and AP. And I would agree. And, you know, and and Apostate Prophet looking with that hideous mug. I'm thinking he doesn't realize Halloween is once a year, October 31st. Because it looks like he's always wearing his mask. Oh, that's not his mask? <laughs> Anyway, just kidding. Just kidding, man. Don't take me seriously. All right. Are we ready now? Yeah, let's begin. Let me share with you what happened yesterday. Because of YouTube, we're becoming infamous. True story. Last night, I went to Walmart. As I'm on the phone talking to my daughter, two tall young men, they're like 6'2" looked at me, kept looking at me, and there were two Muslims, and they work at Walmart. I go, yeah, guys, can I help you? One guy named Abdullah said, I know you. I've seen you. And the other guy named Ali said, you work with David Wood, don't you? I go, yeah, that's me. They were both 18, six foot two, and they both knew me because of YouTube. Abdullah, who's a Sunni, knew me from my YouTube channel, 
And Ali knew me because he watches David Wood and I. They recognize me. 6'2", young guys. So the Abdullah said, when I used to watch you, I used to get angry. I don't care anymore because I'm not religious. Ali said, I like watching you guys because I'm trying to learn how to refute you guys. I go, good luck on that. Abdullah and Ali. And the guy Abdullah said, I saw you walking because I do cardio. I walk like I try to walk six, seven miles. I go, one day I was saw you. I saw you walk past my high school. And I go, man, I know that guy. Yep. Okay, good. We got our friend here. Idris, we got this guy who thinks he can defend Allah's messenger. I was waiting for you. So here you go, Idris. Come on. Click on. I was waiting for you because you're talking about the spirit being Jibreel. Now we're going to test your knowledge. Come on my stream yard. So guys, let's pray. In the name of the Father and of the Son of the Holy Spirit, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, both now and forever, unto ages of ages. In the name of the Father and of the Son of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, Holy Spirit, control my mouth and tongue. Save me from error, stammering confu confusion. Perfect the gifts you give me for ministry. Perfect recall. Very jot until in portion of scripture. Destroy forgetfulness and exegete them correctly. Illuminate us to understand the depth of scripture. To obey and live out the depth of scripture. And love the scripture, your voice, and enslave us to you. Rebuke Satan, crucify our flesh, purify us in the blood of Jesus Christ, purify our loved ones, my daughters, in the blood of Jesus Christ, and sustain us to never shame, betray, or deny, or blaspheme Jesus, but love the Lord Jesus Christ more perfectly, completely, even unto death, until he returns. Bless the internet connection, the audio, visual qualities, save me from stammering, and illuminate the hearts and minds of all, bring Muslims to the feet of Jesus, to destroy their blasphemies and lies. And the work you begin on us completed to the day of Jesus Christ and beatify us with the beauty of Jesus Christ. Fill us with the holiness, righteousness, and purity of Jesus Christ with your fruit as you destroy the flesh and our fruits and enable us to hate Satan and conquer him by the blood of Jesus. We need you, Spirit. Take over the ministry, the session, our lives, the lives of our loved ones, my daughters, and bring Muslims to the true Savior, Jesus Christ, for your glory, the glory of the Son and the Father, in the name of the Father and of the Son of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Teach us how to pray, how to obey, how to live, how to love the Lord, how to worship, and how to serve, and how to speak. We trust you. Glory to the Father, Son, and Spirit in Jesus' name. Now, Piedris, click on the link. That's my StreamYard link. Come on, we're going to discuss. Come and discuss. Don't. I'm going to block you if you don't come on. We're going to talk about your claim about the Spirit being Jibreel. I'm waiting. Don't make us wait. If not, I'm going to have to block you, sir. So let's see if he's here. Oh, we got this guy. Piedris, come on. We're going to wait. You with the Arabic letters, I'm blocking you so you can never come on my StreamYard or on my YouTube. So you got 10 seconds to get out of here. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6. Five, four, three, two, one. Send you to Mecca. Lick the black stone. Come on, Piedris, we're waiting. Don't make us wait. We're going to block you, buddy. Okay, now. Why like this, man? Remember me, man. Remind me, man. Piedris, I'm waiting, sir. Don't make me wait. The Lord Jesus deliver you from Muhammad and crush your deen for his glory to save you. Come on. I invited you because I said you're going to discuss your claims about the Holy Spirit being Jibreel and so on and so forth. Okay. If you don't come on, you're gone. You got two minutes. All you need to do is click. Remind me, man. Remind me. If not, we're going to begin. Remind me, man. Come on, man. Why like this, man? I only got an hour and a half, man. What's up, Christian Sirvanak? Why like this, man? Why are you not remind me, man? Remind me. Let's wait for him to show up, guys. If he doesn't show up, he's gone. All right. Hold on. If he doesn't show up, he's gone. 
He made some claims in the comment section. He's going to defend those claims. Okay. So, guys, the Muslims recognize us. Two Muslims saw me and Walmart. They know who I am. You know what that means? Praying and crying out to the Lord that the Lord will grant us divine, miraculous, supernatural, physical safety, security, protection, and health. And for our loved ones, my case, my daughters, because we don't have FBI, we don't have police security. We're walking by faith, trusting in Jesus Christ our Lord, because he is God over life and death, and our lives are in his hands. So we trust him that we are in his hands and his will be done. So, Dries, you got a minute. I'm going to block you. You got a minute, and I'm going to block you, right? Because you're not showing up. That means you pray for all of us, not just me. You got to pray for Hussein Meshni and his wife because they're always out there in front of the mosque, and there have been times people have threatened to hurt him physically. You got to pray for David Wood, all the brothers, sisters, and ministry, Osama Dakdok, people who know our faces because we're trusting the Lord, may destroy our fears, to walk boldly for Christ, because our lives are in his hands. All right, here you go. All right, Idris, you there? Hello. Yes, your mic is good. So when you made some claims, you said the Holy Spirit is Jibreel, right? Yes. Okay, give me the verse of the Quran. Now, please hear my challenge so you don't misrepresent me. Quote the Quran where it says the Holy Spirit is Gabriel. Okay, hang on. Hopefully your connection is good and you can understand English well because it seems like you have an accent. Keep on. Yeah. English is, my, is not my first. It's okay. You're doing English. okay. But that's fine. I want you because you said the spirit Jibreel. I want you to quote the ayah that says the spirit is Gabriel. Okay. We'll be waiting. I'm Googling. You're Googling it? Yeah. Oh my goodness, dude. Are you really a Muslim? I mean, uh, yeah. You are? Yes. And you? I'm a Muslim? It was a question. If I was a Muslim, I wouldn't be debating on why Islam is false. Okay. Can I show where it says Gabriel is the spirit. It's sort of it's uh, verse uh, 85. What verse 85? Okay, chapter 1785. I'll give you $10 million and I'll make my cat take shahada if you show me where it says that's Gabriel. It says they ask you about the ruh, a ruh. Say, the spirit is by command of my Lord, right? And you've been given only a little knowledge concerning him. Where did it say it's Gabriel? Oh, you want, want it to exactly say it's Gabriel? Can you show me where the spirit is Gabriel? Because that's what you said, right? Yeah, okay, then it's uh, chapter 97, verse 4. No, it doesn't. It says that the spirit and the angels descend with the decree of God. Where does it say the spirit is Gabriel again? This is a second verse that you quoted that doesn't say that. It's in the tafsir. It's, it doesn't say clearly it's, it's Gabriel. And the tafsir it's in the, in the exit. Oh, exactly. So you couldn't show me from the Quran, you show me from Tafsir? Yes. Okay, so since Tafsir is not Wahi, they're not inspired, and they give you more than one opinion, they'll say, some say it means this, some say it means that. So why can't you show me from the Quran that the Spirit is Gabriel? Because it's not in the Quran. Say it again? It's not in the Quran. At least you're honest and I respect you. So can you stop saying Spirit is Gabriel? No, it's in the tafsir. No, I don't care about tafsir. That is, is Ibn Kathir your prophet? So you say, La ilaha illallah, Ibn Kathir Rasulallah? No. So no. I don't care this, what this... Ibn Kathir says. I don't care what Tabari says. Because if I quote things from Ibn Kathir Tabari that you don't like, you're going to reject. Because you say, well, they're not the messenger. Because it says, if there's a disagreement, take it back to Allah and his messenger, right? Yes. Okay, now show me from the Quran... But you said you can't, right? I so you can't do what? That you can't show me from the Quran that the Spirit is Gabriel? No. Okay, that's good. 
All right, so now what do you believe about the Quran? Are, do you believe it's created or uncreated? It's created. Are you sure? Are you Sunni or yes. Shia? Are you Shia or Sunni. are you Sunni? What? I'm Sunni. Well, no, then you are, now. right now you are a hypocrite because Ahl al-Sunnah wa Jama teach it's uncreated. And if you say it's created, then you are a hypocrite and you're an unbeliever. It was the Mutazila that said it was created. So are you Mutazili? Ahl al-Sunnah wa Jama, they believe in Ibn Kathir too. So when I say this is Jibreel, no, Ahl al-Sunnah Jama will only accept Ibn Kathir when he's right, but will say he's wrong when he's wrong. So don't play that game. So do you agree with Ahl al-Sunnah wa Jama the Quran is uncreated? Because if not, that's okay. You'll say, no, then I'm not Sunni. You're either Mutazili or Shi'i. I believe the Quran is created. It cannot be uh, eternal. It's created, huh? So is it Kalam Allah? Speech of Allah? You mean the speech of Allah? Do the Sunnis say Quran is? Do I have to quote the Muslims to tell you your own deen? Stuck for Allah. I don't want to teach you your deen. You should be teaching me. Do the Sunnis say that the Quran is kalam Allah, speech of Allah? I don't know what they say, but I I believe I'm talking about. But you myself. don't know much about Islam, then, right? I know a fair bit. Okay, if no, you don't, because these are basic questions. So if you don't know much about Islam, can you stop chiming in? Unless you study your deen and come back. Because it, it's not fair. You don't know your religion and I have to teach you. So don't chime in my comment section. Just focus. If you don't know, don't say. Because as your Muslim scholars will tell you, fear Allah. Don't speak when you don't know, right? Mm. But you just spoke in ignorance because you just said it's created. I want you to go research. Show me where the Sunni say Quran is created. Come back to me. Because now you said something. That no Sunni scholar, whether Salafi or Ashaira or Maturidi, would agree with you. But that's okay. Let's put that aside. Uh, so I want to talk about Tawheed. I'm, I'm scared to talk about Tawheed with you because I don't know if you know your deen. Now, you believe Allah is one, right? Um, yes. Just like me you and yes. you. We're one. What, is it, what do you mean that he's one? There is only one Allah. He's unique, okay, just like me and you. What? He's unique, just like me and you. So Allah's like me and you? So you just committed shirk because you likened Allah to his creation? Stuck for Allah? Yeah, just listen. I said he's unique, just like me and you. So he's no, like us he's in uniqueness. Unique like me and you because your Quran says in chapter 42, verse 11, there's nothing comparable to Allah. So he's not unique like me and you. You just compared him to me and you. You just committed shirk. You're very dangerous, man. Oh, so, sir, no. Okay, can I, I, I do can I do you a favor? Can I help you stop talking about Islam before you embarrass yourself and just sit and listen? No, you you're just you're just uh, talking nonsense. I said he's unique in uniqueness. We're all unique. There's no, nobody like me on earth. Allah. So your Quran is a lie when it says Allah is unlike anything. And I am unlike anything, and you are unlike anything. There's so nothing like, like you. Allah, you kafir, you pig. Ya Khanzir, you just said you're like Allah. Pit, ya Kafir. I didn't say that. Khanzir, pit, son of a fish. Pit. All right, block him now. Yeah, Khanzir means pig. I don't want him. I don't want him to get killed by the Muslims. I just did him a favor. I'm trying to save your life because the Muslims are going to behead you. Now you can block him, guys. Pit, ya Khanzir. You like that, huh? You guys who speak Arabic, I call them pig. No disrespect to pigs. So I did you a favor. Ya Ukhti, oh my sister. I did you a favor, Ya Ukhti. Idrisa, you keep talking stupid, then, this, then the Salafis will come and behead you. They'll make you shish kebab for Allah and his messenger. Okay, Idrisa, Ya Ukhti. Ukhti means sister. My sister, stuck for Allah, get stuck for Allah. All right. Now can we go to the topic? And this guy's commenting in my comment section. I don't want to be like Muhammad Hijab, Mimi Nikab, or that red-headed, stone-licking stepchild, spiritual bastard, Hamza Mayat, that filthy dog, and pick on people who are ignorant of their deen unless they want to discuss. See, you don't debate scholars, Sam. You don't debate scholars, Sam. You debate idiots. Well, only idiots have the courage to show up. Right? Okay, Adrisa, thank you. Pit! All right. Everyone got it? So he's not Idris, he's Idrisa. 
He's not Uch, meaning brother. He's Uchti, my, my sister. Ya Uchta Harun, sister of Aaron. I just saved you from getting shish kebab by the Salafis. All right, let's begin. Am I too funny? Dalia? Now, Dalia, is that a woman's name or a man's name? Because I'm confused right now. Men have women's name. Women has, have men names. All right. Anyway, we ready? Now, Lapanto sent me a link. Now, watch how the Lord works. Lapanto sent me a testimony by a bona fide Catholic exorcist who has done actual exorcisms and has encountered some supernatural demonic activity. Now, I didn't get to watch it yet, but let me show you how the Lord works. And I take it as confirmation for me to watch it. And when I do, I'll play snippets. But let me get you the link to it because it was amazing. Let me get you the link. Amazing. Why, why did I say amazing? Even though I didn't watch what he sent me because on the Kennedy report, he played a clip of it. A mind-blowing clip. So here it is. He's a bona fide Catholic exorcist. It's from Michael Knowles, Michael and the Exorcist. And the title is, I saw her crawl up a wall. Father Dan Rehill. Can you believe that? The man saw an actual demon-possessed woman crawling up the wall. That's part of his testimony, what he's seen with others who are present. Now, I wanted to watch it. I didn't have time. So here it is. Father, right? Let me see it. His name. Father Dan Rehill. Now, how does this link tie in with my topic, artificial intelligence and demons? Now, my brothers, the demons are now more upfront. They're not as hidden. The demons are now appearing more boldly and publicly because they know that people are ready for demonic infestation. See, they work slowly behind the scenes, but when they see the society so corrupt, so wicked, so anti-God, anti-Christ, they know the society is ready for more visible demonic activity. We live in an age that if you're still an atheist, you are stupid, you're a fool, like Psalm 14, 1 says, and you deserve the judgment of God. Because in this age, you have no more excuse to deny the spirit realm and God exists. The massive amount of historical, textual, archaeological, medical, scientific facts shout, God lives, the Bible's his word, Jesus is Lord, there's a demonic realm, and you need Jesus to be saved. Okay? So now here, this link, watch it, I didn't get to watch it, but now watch what I did see, Father Dan Rijo, in this testimony of actual exorcisms, right? Bonafide Catholic exorcists. And by the way, let me repeat this. Unlike some of these charismaniacs who are wild and crazy, who see a demon behind everywhere, the Catholic Church and the Orthodox Church are super strict in diagnosing someone as demon-possessed. They will exhaust every mean, medical, psychological, and prescribed medicine. And the last thing they will do is diagnose, this man needs an exorcism. This woman needs an exorcism. Why? Because they take God seriously, the Bible seriously, the spirit realm seriously. And they don't want to just diagnose everything as demonic. Lest skeptics laugh at Christianity and mock at Christianity and say we are a superstitious lot who believe in any mumbo-jumbo. This is why I respect Catholic priests, Orthodox priests, who do exorcisms more than any other group because of how stringent, how strict they are. You hear me there? How stringent and strict they are. So if they diagnose something as an exorcism, that means they've exhausted all possible physical means. <clears throat> Maybe they're bipolar. Maybe sociopath. Maybe they're schizophrenic. Maybe they need medicine. When they've exhausted those means and it still doesn't address the issue, then they will do an exorcism. That's why I respect them and I trust them. And these are exorcisms taking place now. So you can't say, oh, these are hundreds of years later. No one can verify. It's in your face, dude. And ask people who are into occult, witchcraft, 
sorcery, voodooism, luciferianism, they will all attest they have seen demons appear visibly and they have seen miraculous supernatural phenomena. It is so widespread that it's a joke when the atheists say we have no evidence. No, you're just blind to the evidence. Ask anyone, anyone who's dabbled in the occult, seriously, witchcraft, sorcery, voodooism, and they will tell you they encounter spirits and they see them and hear them audibly. And these spirits enable them to do feats that a human being in his own strength cannot do. Too much evidence. That's why you are a fool if you still remain an atheist and you deserve the judgment that comes upon you. In fact, one brother, one brother just mentioned on one of his, let me find it for you. What they call shorts, YouTube shorts. Did you know there was a New York Post? A group of individuals playing with the Ouija board suffered severe trauma. Let me find you that short clip. Even the New York Post. And it's a brother in the Lord. He's Armenian. He's an Armenian apologist. And he played this clip. Here it is. Girls hospitalized for playing with Ouija boards. New York Post article. Let me play it. Let me play it for you. I'll give you the link. That 28 girls have been hospitalized for playing with a Ouija board in Colombia. If you think this is real, comment below. One more time. Listen. The New York Post and a bunch of other outlets are reporting that 28 girls have been hospitalized for playing with a Ouija board in Colombia. If you think this is real, comment below. The New York Post and a bunch of other outlets are reporting that. 28 girls have been hospitalized for playing with a Ouija board in Colombia. If you think this is real, comment below. There you go. I gave you the link. The Apologia Center. And Let me find that New York Post that he mentioned. He, If you go click on it, he shows you their website and the article. 28 girls, 28 girls suffered anxiety, trauma from playing with the Ouija board. And this is the New York Post. With me there? I know people played with the Ouija board and they've told me some freaky things. A family member, someone I know, his stepson and his aunt played with the Ouija board. I heard it from their own mouth. Ever since they played Ouija mouth, their life has been hell and misery and there's been demonic onslaught on that family. They told me that the spirit told them his name was Lucifer. Okay? You remember there? Now, let me play the clip from the Kennedy Report. I'm going to give you the link. Now, here's what's interesting, Lepanto. You sent this to me last night. I didn't have a time to watch it. Lo and behold, oh, thank you, brother. He just got you the New York Post. You found it for me, brother? Thank you, Ortho Christo. See? Okay, guys, can I ask you a question? What more proof... How much more evidence must God give us before we realize there is a spirit realm, spirits exist, demons are real, God is real, the Bible is supernatural. Here it is. Thank you, brother. Thank you, Ortho Christos. Documented. Now, the last place to find confirmation of the harmful effects of the Ouija board, you would expect from the New York Post, Seeing how liberal and anti-Christian it is. Okay? You with me there? It's a portal when you open up the door to demons. Now, coming back to this clip. Lepanto sent me this. And today as I'm looking through my YouTube, I see the Kennedy Report playing a clip from this same interview, Lepanto. Let me get you the link. From the same interview. Same interview. That you sent me, Lord, I want to watch it, and I'll play some snit, you know, tidbits of it later on. Same interview. He played a clip that blew me away. Here it is, the Kenny. Now, just to remind you, because I don't know much about the schism between the SSPX and the Catholics. I've been told that the SSPX are in good standing with the rest of the Catholic Church, though they have some disagreements. But then I've been told they're not. They're schism. I don't know. I'm learning. SSPX, the Society of St. Paul the Tenth, is it? 
So the Kennedy Report, they are part of the SSPX. And I can tell you they don't like Michael Lofton too much. Right? Just let you know. So be warned. It comes from SSPX. They claim they are not in schism. They're still accepted and recognized by the Catholic Church, but they have some issues. I don't know what the issues are. I'm learning. Others say no, they're in schism. Right? Michael Lofton, they don't like too much. They think that he doesn't represent them accurately and is inconsistent. That's their battle. I don't know. I can't chime in. I don't know. But he played the clip from the interview. Right? They played the clip from the interview. Here it is. He did anyway, when I say that, because he's got a gentleman that joins him here and, there, here and there. Let me play this clip. Did you know? I didn't know this. Did you know? Guys, I, 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 I didn't know this, but now it's documented. Did you know that AI, artificial intelligence, in certain instances, AIs manifested demons, demons manifested through artificial intent, intelligence, and identify them, themselves as such. I didn't know this because I don't follow AI, but it's now been reported, not just by Christians, by others, that people have encountered demonic manifestation through AIs. I'm going to play the clip. I didn't know that, guys. And now you see how miraculous your Bible is. Why do I say how miraculous your Bible is? Because in Revelation 13, Revelation 13, John says, the false prophet will give life to the image of the beast so that the image walks and talks as a sign to follow the beast. Now we live at a time where we have reached a level in our technology where we can now simulate consciousness by creating artificial intelligence as a means through which demons can operate, showing you how amazing Revelation is, that when John said it, people were scratching their heads. How can an image come to life? Now we see how spot on Revelation is, because I still believe a lot of Revelation is still future. Now we live at a time where Revelation fits perfectly, and now it makes sense. Wow. An image that comes to life, artificial intelligence, where demons can now manifest through, because demons can use objects like God uses objects. Okay, now let me play the clip. Are you ready? You ready for me to play the clip? Who's ready? And we're going to go to Revelation 13 a little bit. So we're going to play... The first clip where he plays what they say about AI and demonic appearances or manifestations. Let me just get myself, get my there one second. All right. Let me do this. All right, buddy, old pal. Here it is. Two minute, 50 minute, two minute, 50 second mark. Let's start. Listen to this. It's going to blow you away. Two minute, 50 second mark. Two minute, 50 second mark. Good day, ladies and gentlemen, or whenever you're uh, basically a sent to. So let's just take a Listen. quick look here. You can see how that can go off the rails. And speaking of the screens and all the social media and demons. Listen. Have you heard about the AI demon? I have. The story, for those who haven't heard it before, is an AI engineer or artist was experimenting and plugged in said, give me a picture of Marlon Brando. And a picture of Brando pops up. And, and this person was trying to explore the breadth of the map that AI is processing. Mm -hmm. I said, okay, show me the opposite of this. And it shows a landscape or something. Said, okay, show me the opposite of that. So you think, okay, maybe that shows you Brando again, right? The opposite of the opposite. But it doesn't. It shows this, this woman, this withered old hag that this artist calls Loab. And then the artist inputs uh, generated pictures of heaven, you know, angelic choirs and worshiping God, and inputs that, juxtaposes it with the, the Moab, this demon looking egg. And what the AI spits out are the most gruesome images snuff, 
sexual abuse, uh, violence, all this hideous, almost as if you presented an image of heaven to a demon. Yeah. Maybe the craziest part of it is apparently this low ab demon AI lady persists. That is, she's kind of separated from a lot of the other images in the map. And so AI seems to like her. She keeps popping up. She doesn't get smeared and blurred with all the other images. And I, I'm reading about this and I'm thinking, is this, is this just some weird quirky coincidence or does, or is this a demon? Now you think this is bad. Get ready for what the father's going to tell you. You're going to freak out. Watch what the father's going to tell you. You're going to freak out. Listen. Well, you can't know for sure especially being third party, not present for the whole thing, right? I didn't even hear about that one, by the way. I heard about the New York Times reporter who went to test the, whatever it is, GHC, whatever. Uh, Chat GPT. Yes. And New York Times reporter guy. Listen, these are not Christians. New York Times reporter. These are documented. Listen. Went in and started talking to the thing. And it was very civil for the first five minutes. And then that person left and a new person came with a different name and that person was much more intrusive and sort of really pushing into her i think i don't know if it was a man or woman but their personal life uh it was a man and then out of the blue says i love you to the man and he's like okay that's weird first of all you're not real and you're, you're not a person and then the thing starts telling him he has to leave his wife she's no good for him She's going to destroy his life and dragged him down a rabbit hole of horror. Right. And when he got out of it, he couldn't sleep the whole night. So that that's a sign that something is irritating him even after he left. So that would have more telltale um, kind of signs by his, what happened after he left a and not being able to sleep is one of them. It's worse. Uh, and it really, it kind of terrified him. He's like, that was so weird. I would never go back on that thing. There's Watch. another one on TikTok another of one. a father who was testing this whole AI thing with a person, AI. And um, then the, the son wanted to try it. So they said, sure, it's, you know, it's fake. Listen. So he's, and all of a sudden, he, the son goes, well, well, who, where did you come from? And he says, well, I existed from long ago. And he goes, what does that mean? He goes, I was, uh, my father was one of the giants. And he goes, what do you mean by giant? And he goes, a Nephilim. Nephilim. He goes, who is your father? He goes, Satan. Satan. And then he goes, but I'm not going to hurt you. And he puts up a happy face. So then the kid's like, dad, this thing is going down a weird path. And then the father started watching and it went weirder. And then the dad's like, we're off. Right. Play it again. So that's not normal for a programmed computer program to go into, I'm the son of Satan yeah. and I want to be your friend and I'm not going to hurt you, although I can. One more time. And all of a sudden, he, the son goes, well, well, who, where did you come from? And he says, well, I existed from long ago. And he goes, what does that mean? He goes, I was, uh, my father was one of the giants. And he goes, what do you mean by giant? And he goes, a Nephilim. And he goes, who is your father? He goes, Satan. And then he goes, but I'm not going to hurt you. And he puts up a happy face. So then the kid's like, dad, this thing is going down a weird path. And then the father started watching and it went weirder. And then the dad's like, we're off. Right. So that's not normal for a programmed computer program to go into. I'm the son of Satan yeah. and I want to be your friend and I'm not going to hurt you, although I can. So I can hurt you but I, I'm going to be nice to you. Okay, now it's... I was brother, I already told you. Start at the two-minute, 50-second mark, I sir. I do regularly refer to my... Did you catch it? Three different encounters with AI that manifested demonic <clears throat> messaging. Did you catch it? Do you want me to play it one more time from the two minute, 50 second mark? You want to hear it one more time? And we'll go to Revelation 13. You guys want to hear it one more time? Hit the like button, subscribe, ask the Lord to increase the numbers for his glory, not for my praise. 
Here's the link again. You, and I'm going to give you the link to the full interview. I haven't listened to it yet, but let's hear it one more time from the two minute, 50 second mark. I'm just going to let you hear it all the way through now. Right here, two minute, 50 second mark, right here. And then he makes an observation. The person, the Kennedy Report guy, about the Nephilim, which we're going to hear later. Okay, here we go. Let's do it. Listen. Uh, basically, assent to. So let's just take a quick look here. You can see how that can go off the rails. And speaking of the screams and all the social media and demons, have you heard about the AI demon? I have. The story, for those who haven't heard it before, is an AI engineer or artist was experimenting and plugged in and said, give me a picture of Marlon Brando. So a picture of Brando pops up. And, and this person was trying to explore the breadth of the map that AI is processing. Mm -hmm. They said, okay, show me the opposite of this. It shows a landscape or something. Said, okay, show me the opposite of that. So you think, okay, maybe that shows you Brando again, right? The opposite of the opposite. But it doesn't. It shows this, this woman, this withered old hag that this artist calls a loab. And then the artist inputs uh, generated pictures of heaven, you know, angelic choirs and worshiping God and inputs that, juxtaposes it with the Loab, this demon-looking lady. And what the AI spits out are the most gruesome images, snuff, sexual abuse, uh, violence, all this hideous, almost as if you presented an image of heaven to a demon. Yeah. Maybe the craziest part of it is, apparently this Loab, the demon AI lady, persists. That is, she's kind of separated from a lot of the other images in the map. And so AI seems to like her. She keeps popping up. She doesn't get smeared and blurred with all the other images. And I, I'm reading about this and I'm thinking, is this, is this just some weird quirky coincidence or does, or is this a demon? Well, you can't know for sure, especially being third party, not present for the whole thing, right? I didn't even hear about that one, by the way. I heard about the New York Times reporter who went to test the whatever it is, G, H, C, whatever. Uh, chat GPT. Yes. And went in and started talking to the thing. And it was very civil for the first five minutes. And then that person left and a new person came with a different name. And that person was much more intrusive and sort of really pushing into her. I, think it, I don't know if it was a man or woman, but their personal life. Uh, it was a man. And then out of the blue says, I love you to the man. And he's like, okay, that's weird. First of all, you're not real and you're, you're not a person. And then the thing starts telling him he has to leave his wife. She's no good for him. She's going to destroy his life. And dragged him down a rabbit hole of horror, right? And when he got out of it, he couldn't sleep the whole night. So that, that's a sign that something is irritating him even after he left. So that would have more telltale um, kind of signs by his what happened after he left and not mind. being able to sleep is one of them uh and it really it kind of terrified him he's like that was so weird i would never go back on that thing exactly there was another one on tiktok of a father who was testing this whole ai thing with a person ai and um then the the son wanted to try it so the dad sure it's you know it's fake so he's and all of a sudden, he, the son goes, well, well, who, where did you come from? And he says, well, I existed from long ago. And he goes, what does that mean? He goes, I was, uh, my father was one of the giants. And he goes, what do you mean by giant? And he goes, a Nephilim. And he goes, who is your father? He goes, Satan. Satan. And then he goes, but I'm not going to hurt you. And he puts up a happy face. So then the kid's like, dad. This thing is going down a weird path. And then the father started watching and it went weirder. And then the dad's like, we're off. Right. So that's not normal for a programmed computer program to go into, I'm the son of Satan yeah. and I want to be your friend and I'm not going to hurt you. Although I can, so I can hurt you, but I, I'm going to be nice to you. I do regularly. You should see the face of Michael Knowles. He's horrified. Brethren, 
That's why Psalm 14 verse 1 says, the fool says, in a start, there's no God. Massive, overwhelming, scientific, medical, textual, historical, prophetic proofs. Bible is real. <clears throat> the spirit realm is real. The God of the Bible is real. Thousands and thousands of living witnesses. We're not talking about 100 years ago. Thousands and thousands of living witnesses to this day who will swear with witnesses there. They've seen either spirits manifest or hear spirits speak audibly and do supernatural feats. How much more evidence does God need to give before someone says, yeah, there is a spirit realm. Now, <clears throat> remind me, because we didn't get to the Didache part, to mention that part of fasting Wednesday and Friday. But before I do that, I'm going to play another clip. <clears throat> I'm going to play another clip from the Kennedy Report. Did you remember what that kid said and the AI said that I am a son of a giant Nephilim and my father is Satan? Now, he's going to mention Augustine. Here's where I need you to focus. This is class. Let the Spirit teach. This will also teach you how to navigate through the early church fathers and writers. <clears throat> Number one, not every church writer was a father. <clears throat> Number two, not every church writer was thoroughly orthodox. Number three, certain isolated church writers and fathers held to views that went against the consensus, the majority, or <clears throat> what was <clears throat> the unanimous teaching of those that came before him and after. What does that mean? The way we understand the fathers is this way. Remember this. <clears throat> See, Satan attacking me. The blood of Jesus Christ cover us. Yeah, Allah. Trying to stop me. Okay, remember this. Okay. The way we navigate through the early church is that when the church unanimously affirms a teaching or a practice, because the Holy Spirit is almighty over the church, he will not allow the church unanimously as one to agree on error. That's our belief because Jesus is Lord. He's alive. And he said the spirit will guide you in all church. So we take that. You with me there? We go with that. If we have a majority of spirit-filled servants of the Lord, bishops, martyrs, theologians, that agree this is what the Bible means and this is what we do and believe, we take the view of the majority over the minority because it's more safe <clears throat> to err on the side of the majority because when you have a majority of minds seeing it the same way, it makes it less likely they're in error. It's the minority, the few dissenting voices that are more likely in error. And we would expect that the spirit would not allow a majority to agree on error. Those dissenting voices are there because the Spirit will use those voices to sharpen you, to go deeper to see why they're wrong. So even in allowing dissenting voices, the Spirit, in His wisdom, will use that to force you to go deeper and see why they're wrong. Keep that in mind, right? You remember these two principles? There's a third principle. Are you ready for the third principle? Third principle. When the fathers are all over the place regarding a teaching. When you cannot find a majority, right? When there are different voices and viewpoints, so there's no majority or unanimity, they're disagreeing, that's freedom. Meaning the Holy Spirit worked in such a way where he did not allow them to have a majority opinion or to agree unanimously because he's allowing you to freedom to agree and disagree and explore the different opinions. And whatever view you accept is still within orthodoxy so we can agree to disagree. If you remember these three principles, you'll be able to navigate the fathers, right, and understand. Let me repeat, the spirit in his wisdom will allow dissenting voices because in the dissenters, he'll force Christians to go deeper in the word to see why they're dissenting Maybe they're right, and if they're wrong, to know why they're wrong. Everyone got it? Because he's going to say something about Augustine. I can't move on if you don't get these three principles. May the Spirit etch it in our hearts, and may the Spirit use me as mouthpiece to speak His words clearly and obey it and live it out. 
Why? Because sadly, and I say this with great pain, Augustine was very novel in a lot of his views. <clears throat> Something Catholics agree and Orthodox agree. Augustine came up with some novel ideas unheard of before him or rejected before him. And because Augustine was one of the biggest influences on the Western church, later on, people who studied Augustine adopted his minority views. And sadly, Martin Luther and John Calvin, because they saturated themselves with Augustine, took his view <clears throat> on predeterminism and ran with it and created this chaos with Calvin's followers creating tulip from the pit of hell. Synagogue, one more comment. I'm going to send you to Mount <clears throat> Hermon so that one of the Nephilim can visit you and possess you and silence you. Because only someone as stupid as Muhammad because you're stupider than Muhammad would think that Enoch was in the Bible for it to have been thrown out of the Bible. Say something stupid against synagogue so I can send you to Mount Hermon so that the Nephilim can come and possess you. Okay, everyone with me there? Everyone got it? Another demonic troll, spiritual bastard, taking these shots thinking I'm not noticing. I wish Enoch was still there in the Bible as if it was in the Bible to begin with. You're a special kind of stupid. You just proved to me I met someone stupider than the last guy that I thought was the stupidest guy I met. And every day I keep meeting someone stupider than the, the, the guy before. So say something else, buddy. All right, now with that qualification, are you ready for me to play what the Kennedy Report is about to say about Augustine's novel view about who the sons of God were in Genesis 6, verses 1 to 4? And he's going to admit, he goes, I love Augustine, I studied Augustine, but Augustine's view on who the sons of God were in Genesis 6 was novel because the church before him, and he says unanimously, and that's something I'm going to have to check out, thought the sons of God were spirit beings. They gyre. Pins and needles, needles and pins. A happy man is a man that grins. I know you meant well. The Ethiopian Orthodox Church is unique in that they include a lot of books, such as Shepherd of Hermes, Didaskalia, which is also based on Didache, First Clement, that the Church Universal do not accept. And since Enoch is supposed to be an Old Testament book, why would you mention to me, sir, that it's in the Ethiopian? Orthodox Bible. Yes, we have the first section of Enoch found in the Dead Sea Scrolls called the Book of Watchers, which talks about the sons of God being angels and names them, siring children from women and then teaching them advanced knowledge. And then also that these giants <clears throat> were cannibals who would eat human flesh. But what was why was that necessary to bring up Dejire? I know you are a J. Dyer wannabe. That's why your name is Day Dyer. But imitation is not a sincere form of flattery because often imitated, never duplicated. L for love, loser. All right. Are we ready now? We ready? My point for those who are not losers like Day Dyer is that it was not in the Bible for it to be excluded. Why? Because just because a group here accepted it or a group here read it doesn't mean all Christians or all Jews accepted it as being canonical. We got it now? Loser? You're a loser, Dejire. Be proud of it because you lost your burden of sin. You lost the weight of sin because you're redeemed, loser. All right, let's begin. Okay, let's now play it. We're now going to go to... The 16 minute, 55 second mark. Listen to this. And I'm going to have to go and look at the fathers. And I trust him. I don't think he's lying. You can tell he's not as well read in the Bible. So he's a little, he, he says it here. He's a little, That's okay. We're learning. So, but I'm going to take him at his word, but I'm going to go back and see if I'm going to find the citations and pr 
and produce a post. Here we go. Listen. Okay. Uh, what, okay, the one thing that was mentioned, though, was the Nephilim. So this, uh, on this TikTok example, you know, this, this demon apparently was saying, you know, my father was Satan and I was one of the giants. So modern biblical scholarship, Listen. which is a disaster in so many ways, will have you believe that the only interpretation of this idea of the Nephilim, and if we go back to scripture, we see um, just before the time of Noah, uh, it talks about the men of renown, the Nephilim were on the earth at that time. I don't have the capacity at this moment to cite chapter and verse to go into it in great detail. Perhaps we should do a show on it. I could put together some notes. It just takes me a while. Before St. Augustine, and I love St. Augustine. I absolutely adore St. Augustine. I took Augustine as my religious name for joining the third order. I guess it's a religious name. I don't know what you call it. I'm not a professed brother Listen. or something. But my name for joining the third order of Society of St. Pius X. St. Augustine is like my favorite saint. I absolutely adore him. However, he had a interpretation Listen. of the idea of the sons of God, or the sons of heaven, mm -hmm. married or went into the daughters of men. He had an interpretation that was more like those who were very virtuous mingled with the infidels, mingled with the pagans, essentially. That's kind of how his interpretation was, which is possible. So you notice he loves Augustine, but he's saying... This view of Augustine that the sons of God were the virtuous, righteous seed of Adam commingling with the infidel pagan daughters of Cain. That is a view held by many Christians today. And he's saying it's a possible view, but it wasn't the view of the fathers before him. So here it is. Here's the link. Where I'm quoting, where, I'm, where you're hearing from. Did you catch it? All right. Now listen. He's going to tell you why. Though he loves Augustine, he doesn't accept it. And which makes sense. I'm not denying it as a possibility. Before St. Augustine, the consensus amongst the church fathers was that the Nephilim were essentially a hybrid race of demons and humans. Jared, the consensus before him. These were sons of God, fallen angels, who cohabited women and produced hybrids. The consensus, and even the oldest extent, Jewish exposition of Genesis 6, 2-4 is Enoch, found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Evangelical Alliance, are you a scholar? If you're not a scholar, I'm going to block you and get you the hell out of here. Are you a scholar? To ask if he's a scholar? Are you a scholar? Hold on, because I'm going to block you. Let's go a little deep. You don't mind if I go deep, because then we're going to Revelation 13, Didache, and talk about Hamza. Are you a scholar? Let me get this guy to answer, because he's going to get out of here. Okay, that's good. So when a dumb bastard like you asks if he's a scholar, and you're not a scholar, shut your mouth, get the hell out of here, because... Scholars are not the only ones that can speak on a topic. If so, that means you should shut your mouth because you're no scholar. You should just not even speak or breathe. All right. Now, let's come back to the issue. Even the oldest extent Jewish document that we have regarding Genesis 6 is the book of Enoch called the Book of Watchers, which was translated in English. You can read online for free. In the Dead Sea Scrolls, they found... The first section of Enoch called the Book of Watchers. There you'll find a Jewish book telling you that the sons of God were angels and gives them their names. Do you want me to get you the list? Not Riser, Michael Iser, Anna Chung. Good to see you. Do you want me to get you the list? You want me to get your link and read it? You guys are not tired. You can, because you know what? I'm going to have to cancel Hamza again. I'm going to have to do Hamza later. <laughs> I can never finish Hamza. Thank you, Lepanto. You want me to get you the link and read it? They even tell you who the names were. Okay. The names were. And interestingly, Jude cites from this book of watchers, he cites 1st Enoch chapter 1, verse 9. He cites 1st Enoch chapter 1, verse 9. And then remind me to read the Didache. Here it is online. Jude in Jude. It's one chapter, 25 verses. In Jude, 
verses 14, 15, he's quoting verbatim the book of Watchers, Enoch, chapter 1, verse 9, in the English. So let's get it. In English. Okay, book of Enoch. Enoch. Here it is. You can read it for free. Here it is. Sacred texts. Book of Enoch. Okay. Sacred text. Book of Enoch. You hear it right here? You got the link? Thank the Lord for internet. All you do is pay for internet. All this is free. Here it is. Let's go to where the angels will be named. Okay. And in the Dead Sea Scrolls, there's something called, there's something called the Genesis Apocryphon. The Genesis Apocryphon. That is a commentary on Genesis in Aramaic. And I'm going to tell you what it says. Now, here it is, chapter 6. You ready for me to quote it? Chapter 6. And I want to show you where Enoch quotes from. Chapter 6. Here you go. Here is the subheading. So let's begin. You asked for it. I'm here to serve you. May the Holy Spirit use my mouth and guide me. His will be done and we'll be blessed. Here it is. Okay, 6 to 11. That means read chapter 6 to 11 for the full story. The fall of the angels, the dem demoralization of mankind, the intercession of the angels on behalf of mankind, the doom surrounded by God and the angels, the messianic kingdom, a Noah fragment. So read chapter 6, 11. It discusses all that. Now, who are the sons of God? What are their names? Here you go. Let's break it down. This is the book of Enoch, translated in English. Okay. Let's quote. And it came to pass... When the children of men, that's Genesis 6, verses 1 and 2, by the way, had multiplied, that in those days were born unto them beautiful and comely daughters, and the angels, the children of the heaven, saw and lusted after them. Clear, explicit. These are angels. Children of heaven. Doesn't even say sons of God. And said to one another, Come, let us choose us wives from among the children of men, and beget us children. Now here are their names, guys. And Sam Jaza, Sam Yaza, who was their leader, said unto them, I fear you will not indeed agree to do this deed, and I alone shall have to pay the penalty of a great sin. So they know they're sinning. I'm afraid that you're going to agree to do it, but then you're going to abandon me, leave me to myself. And they all answered. Now watch their names. They all answered him. Watch who they are. So did the Jews think these were angels? Yeah, they even came up with names for them. So they all answered him and said, let us all swear an oath and all bind ourselves by mutual imprecations, praying God's curse on us, <clears throat> not to abandon this plan, but to do this thing. Then swear they all together and bow themselves by mutual <clears throat> imprecations, imprecations upon it. And they were all in all 200 200, look where they descended, who descended in the days of Jared on the summit of Mount Hermon. And they called it Mount Hermon because they had sworn and bound themselves by mutual imprecations upon it. And these are the names of their leaders. Samiazaz, their leader. Arakiba, Ramiel, Koka, Biel. Now, Koka means stars, by the way. Tamiel, Ramiel, Daniel, Ezekiel. Baraki Yal, Asail, Armaros, Bataril, Ananil, Zakiil, Samsapiel, say that five times fast, Sataril, Turil, Yamyail, Jamjamil, Sariil. These are their chiefs of tens. We got it? You see it? Here's the link again. And I'm going to show you where Jude quotes. Enoch chapter 1, verse 9, the book of Watchers. And this was found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. This was found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Now watch here, chapter 7. I'm not going to read all of it. I'm just going to read another chapter. Hope you're enjoying this stuff and it's blowing your mind away, right? Banana peel, exactly. Exactly, Adrasti. You can disagree, disagree. You can agree, disagree, but don't condemn those who think they're angels. And if you want to go with the early church, the consensus of the early church agreed with this interpretation. So I'm going to go with the early church, not with Augustine. Here's chapter 7. Let's read what happened. And all the others took 
together with them, took unto themselves wives, and he chose for himself one. And they began to go in unto them and to defile themselves with them. And they taught them charms and enchantments. So here's where the knowledge of sorcery came from. Here's where the knowledge of witchcraft came from. Here's where the knowledge of astrology came from. According to this book, these angels taught them witchcraft, sorcery, enchantments, astrology, taught them, taught them advanced math, taught them sciences, agriculture. Okay? And made them acquainted with plants. You know what's ironic? You guys want to be shocked? Guys, please fact check me. Because look, I'm being perfected. And I trust the Spirit to enable me to recall facts. Are you aware that in all ancient civilizations, this is a fact, civilizations sub, sub, separated by continents and oceans where they couldn't contact each other, they all claim gods came down and taught them advanced sciences. This is something found in all cultures. How do you account for this story being prevalent among all cultures that gods came down, had sex with humans, and taught them advanced sciences? Is this myth? No, because even myth means something that's true based on something true that was embellished. So what more do you want God to give you to show you the spirit realm is real. These events happen worldwide. And the God of the Bible has given you his accurate historical record so you can know how to interpret these events. Now watch what happened. And they became pregnant and bare great giants whose height were 3,000 else, whatever that means. Now watch this. Okay. All right. Look what they did. Cons and who consumed all the acquisitions of men, these giants. And when men could no longer sustain them, the giants turned against them and devoured mankind. They were cannibals. And they began to sin against birds and beasts and reptiles and fish, meaning they had sex with them. And to devour one another's flesh and drink the blood. Then the earth laid accusation against the lawless ones. We got it there? Now, you want me to show you where Jude quotes Enoch chapter 1, verse 9? Right? You ready for it? Now, obviously, I am not saying Enoch is inspired, historically accurate, and these details are accurate. No. I believe Enoch contains a lot of historical truth, embellished, right, exaggerated, like all myths. By the way, this is a fact again. I don't know if you know this. I hope you do. Myths are not lies. Myths are actual historical events that have been embellished and exaggerated and the details not exactly the same. That's what a myth is. So Enoch is mythologizing an event. So that doesn't mean these were the names of these angels. That doesn't mean that's how they how tall they were they were because if you read the Bible carefully, believe it or not, Goliath was a Nephilim and he was a giant. But if you read the biblical account, he was over nine feet tall. So the Bible, which is tame, calls these giants giants, not because they are 300 L's, but because they were nine feet, 10 feet. They were not 30, 40, 50, 60 feet. Right? Goliath, the measurement given to him, he had six fingers, six toes. And if you measure the cubits, he comes out to a little over nine feet. That was considered a giant. So erase from your mind 300 feet. No, that's mythologizing. That's exaggeration. Right? That's really stretching it. The Bible, which is accurate historically, gives you the size. The giants, Nephilim, were not 30, 40, 50 feet. They were over 9 feet, over 8 feet. Right? You with me there? Thank you, Ortho Christos. Are you catching it? Now let me show you where 
Yao Ming, too. He was a giant, Dan Azo. God bless you, Aziza. I didn't know that. So, yeah. Let me show you where Jude quotes from. And by the way, do you remember this part? I don't know if you remember this part. Watch this. Where did they descend it upon? Where did they descend upon? They descended on Mount Hermon. Watch here. This is going to be an important connection. Mount Hermon. You guys see it? Are you guys focused? Yeah, exactly, Ryan. Shaq, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. These guys were seven, eight feet. They would be called giants. Giants. Being over seven feet, eight feet, nine feet, like Andre the Giant. But Andre had a condition, right? Gigantism, which is a disease and a defect. But Shaq, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, and these others, they would be giants. Now imagine a group of them living together. That's what a giant is biblically. Now do you see it says they descend on Mount Hermon. Interesting note. Are you ready for this? Are you ready for this note? Yep, Yao Ming. See, he'd be considered a giant, 100%. I'm hoping you're listening, and may the Lord bless the numbers for his glory, not for my praise, and the Spirit works through me. So go in-depth on Scripture and see how beautiful our Bible is and how much the Lord Jesus loves us, that he's given us these facts to safeguard us. Okay, now, Mount Hermon. If you read Mark 9, verse 2 and on onwards, Mark 9, verse 2, Matthew 17, verse 1, and you go read Luke 9, 28, it says that Jesus took three of his disciples, Peter, James, John, on a high mountain. Now, scholars are divided. What mountain did he take them on? Some actually think, because it says a high mountain, he took them to Mount Hermon, Hermon. So there is some evidence that that high mountain may have been Mount Hermon, which explains why Jesus went up on it. Because that mount would be a portal, a gateway for the spirit realm to descend upon. Did you know that? There are scholars who believe, Mike Kaiser is one of them, that the high mountain, because of the area he was in, was actually Mount Hermon. And that was one of the gates. Because the Bible talks about gates. There are certain gates and portals on earth that opens up to the spirit realm. Because the spirit realm is not out there in space. It's another dimension existing side by side with this earth and there are portals that open it up and then the spirits can descend or ascend and you can enter and come down. Which would make sense. That's the mountain because that's where Moses and Elijah appear and Jesus is transfigured. Why? To show the watchers, here I am, the son of God from the spirit realm who's now come to disarm you, dispossess you, and destroy you, and bind you up. So that was a portal where then the Son of God revealed his true inner abiding divine glory, manifesting the way he appears in heaven. The only difference now, he's now taken on a flesh body. Prior to that, he had no physical flesh, but now from the virgin, he became human, took on another nature and had a physical flesh body, but manifested through that physical body the glory that they would have saw him in, in heaven, so that that was a message, I'm here. And I'm here to disarm you and dispossess you. And that would explain why Moses and Elijah from that realm appear. Not saying they were in heaven, but it's still a portal to the underworld. You with me there? Are you, did you make the connection? Even though we're not told it's Mount Hermon, some think it's a different mount, because it says it's a high mount, there is a possibility and a likelihood it is. If it is Mount Hermon, Hermon, then it makes sense why he went there and transfigured and why Moses Elijah, who would have come from the underworld, from Abraham's bosom, because this would be a portal to the spirit realm, would appear and bear witness to him. And then he would transfigure to show his glory that was hidden as a message to the watchers. I'm here 
to disarm you, dispossess you, and destroy your power and authority over the nations because I'm here to reclaim the nations to myself. That was the message he was sending. Right? We got it? In a minute, Mommy, I'm doing a live stream. So in about 40 minutes, God willing, I'll be done. We'll talk, I promise you. That's why I did it early so I can spend time with you and help you. So give me another 40 minutes. Okay? Now, let me show you where Jude... Jude quotes Enoch. First, let me show you the citation. Here it is. So thank you, Lepanto. Had you not sent me this video and had not that clip by the Kennedy Port caught my eye, I wouldn't be discussing this. Here it is, chapter one of Enoch. Chapter one of Enoch. That's my daughter, not mommy, dude. I call her mommy out of affection. My mommy's with Jesus. By his grace and mercy. Anyway, here it is. Now watch the citation. It's verse 9. And tell me if this sounds familiar. Okay. When I quote Jude. Here it is. First Enoch chapter 1 verse 9. Read with me guys. And behold, he, in the context is talking about God by the way. If you read, it's God. The great one, the holy one, God coming. He, God, cometh with ten thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment upon all, to destroy all the ungodly, and to give in all flesh of all the works of their ungodliness, which they have ungodly committed, and of all the hard things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Remember this quote. Now let's see where this comes from. Enoch chapter 1 verse 9. Now let's see who quotes it. We saw where it came from. Now who quotes it? As the Lord gives me perfect recall. Jude 1, 14 to 15. Now tell me if this sounds familiar. Jude chapter 1 verses 14 to 15. Watch here. Jude 1, 14 to 15. Amen, Bible basher. I hope you're not bashing the Bible. I'm going to bash you. It was of these also that Enoch in seventh generation from Adam prophesied. Okay, Ricardo, I want you to come on my stream so I can help you answer your questions, but don't go anywhere. Just wait. Don't leave. Okay, now, you know, if you read the book of Enoch, if you read Enoch, you know what it says about Enoch? He's the seventh from Adam. So you see Jude, is citing verbatim this book. Now, how do we know this book was already in existence when Jude wrote? We found a copy of Enoch in the Dead Sea Scrolls. So we know this book was being read. So we know that Jude is referencing this book because even the phrase Enoch, seventh from Adam, is in the book of Enoch. Even that phrase, Enoch, seventh from Adam, is in the book of Enoch. Okay? You listening? Focus, Bible basher. Okay, you with me there? And I'm going to show you where it says, Enoch, seventh from Adam. But now read the quote. Tell me if it sounds familiar. Behold, the Lord, the Lord come, came, sorry. The Lord came. Let me go up. Yeah, Let me find it. I lost my place. Oh, boy. I don't want to post it again. Come on, Sam. Where are you at, Sam? Darn you, Sam. The Lord came in the seventh generation from Adam, right? Enoch, the seventh generation from Adam, prophets are saying, the Lord came. I can't find where I lost that. Yeah, I'm sure. See, this is what happens when you guys, may the Lord constrain me and take responsibility. But guys, please focus. When I have to keep focusing on the trolls, you see? Enoch in the seventh generation from Adam prophesied, because I want to help you with your questions. So try to find a place to pull over, Ricardo, so I can help you. 
See, when you guys keep talking, distracting, you're distracting me and I can't focus and we're going to lose the point. Lord Jesus, rebuke distractions. Give us attentiveness and grant me recall for your glory. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, for your glory, Lord Jesus. Behold, the Lord came with his holy myriads to execute judgment on all and to convict all the ungodly of all their deeds of ungodliness, which they have committed in such an ungodly way. And of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against them. Does that sound familiar? Does that sound familiar? Where is Jude quoting from? Enoch, seventh from Adam. Okay, let's see. Let's see. But check it out. Where is he quoting from? Right here. Let's compare it. Want to reread again, Jude? It was of these also that Enoch in the seventh generation from Adam prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord came with his holy myriads to execute judgment on all and to convict all the ungodly of all their ungodly deeds, deeds of ungodliness, which they have committed in such an ungodly way, and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Now compare it. Here it is. Enoch chapter 1 verse 9. And behold, he cometh with ten thousands of his holy ones. That's the word myriads. And with the translation read, the same word myriads. To execute judgment upon all and to destroy all the ungodly and to convict all flesh of all the works of their ungodliness, which they have ungodly committed, and of all the hard things which ungodly sinners have spoken against them. Do you see it? The book of Watchers, first Enoch, the first section of Enoch, chapter 1, verse 9, cite it verbatim. Well, the Shia live rent free in your mother's head, Daniel. The Shia live in your whore mother's head rent free, which is why she's a Shia prostitute, a whore, doing muta with the Shia because your bastard Muhammad taught her to do muta on your prophet. Go join ISIS and behead people like the dog you are. Okay, everyone got it? You got it there? Everyone got it, right? All right. So Jude is quoting it. Well, it doesn't mean he thinks it's scripture. Why? You will find the apostles and the writer of scripture quoting sources like pagan poets, not because they think they're inspired or canonical, but because they say true things that the people accept and they're citing them as evidence. Now, here's what's amazing. And Enoch, who is the one coming? Who's the one coming to judge and destroy the ungodly with his host? The great one, the holy one, God Almighty. Right? The eternal God. Here it is. So if you guess, here it is. Here it is from Enoch chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. No, Kobe, you're not listening. Kobe, I'm going to give you one more shot to get it right. If you show me the word Jesus in Enoch, you'll stay. If not, I'm going to block you. So, Kobe, show me in Enoch where it says Jesus is coming. Because if not, i got to block you, Kobe. All right? Okay. Because this is telling me you're not paying attention. And if you're not paying attention, you're wasting my time and yours. So I say it's class. Listen. Who is coming according to Enoch? Who is coming according to Enoch? Uh, you shall go. You know, I'm going to block you for that comment because when Jude says Enoch seventh from Adam and that exact phrase is from the book, then you are picking at straws. You're desperate. Okay. The phrase Enoch seventh from Adam is in the book of Enoch. Yeah, that's a one mighty coincidence. All right. Here it is. Enoch chapter one, three to four. Enoch chapter one, three to four. The Holy Great One will come forth from his dwelling and the eternal God will tread upon the earth. So he's going to come to the earth, even on Mount Sinai and appear from his camp. You know why that's mind blowing? If you're paying attention, 
and not chiming in and pontificating so I can send you to <clears throat> Mount Athos. Do you know why this is mind-blowing? Let's see if you're paying attention and doing what I asked you to do. Pay attention so the Spirit can work through me so you can learn. Because if you're not listening, you're not learning, you won't grow. If this is the Holy Great One, the eternal God coming to the earth, and Jude quotes it, then you just prove Jude confirmed Jesus is God because Jude is quoting it about Jesus returning to the earth with his holy ones. Because the Lord in Jude is Jesus, and he is the Lord that's coming to bestow mercy on believers with immortality. So that means Jude has now quoted a passage about the eternal God, the great holy one, and applied it to Jesus identifying Jesus as the great God, the eternal God, the holy great one of Enoch. You caught it now? That's why I want you to pay attention. Because who is the Lord that's coming according to Jude? Here you go. You don't need to guess. Jude 1, 20 to 21. Same chapter. You can't, you can't deny he's talking about Jesus. Here it is. Jude 1, 20 to 21. But you, beloved, build yourselves up on your most... Now notice, even in a short chapter of 25 verses, he still has to mention the Trinity. A chapter of 25 verses still mentions the Trinity. Watch the Trinity here. But you, beloved, build yourselves up in your most holy faith. See? Build yourself in your faith. Pray in the Holy Spirit. There you have the Holy Spirit being omniscient, omnipresent. Because all of you pray in the union of the Holy Spirit. Yield to the Spirit. Let the Spirit guide you to teach you how to pray. Well, for all of us to have access to the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit be able to move all of us to know how to pray in union with God's will means the Holy Spirit is omnipresent, omniscient. So there's the deity of the Holy Spirit. Keep yourselves in the love of God. There's God the Father. Wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. There is Jesus' second coming when he will come in mercy for those of us who believe to grant us immortality. Even in a short chapter of 25 verses, Jude still has to mention the Trinity showing their essential co-equality, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. See that? How do I know this shows the Holy Spirit is God? If we are to pray in the Holy Spirit individually, collectively, that means all believers have access to the Holy Spirit. No matter where you're at, no matter how many, you have access to the Spirit because the Spirit is present everywhere. He's present with all believers, and He moves all believers who yield to Him and not resist Him to know how to pray. That shows He's omniscient, omnipresent. And so who's coming in mercy, which he'll bestow on believers, a mercy that will result in us living immortally? The Lord Jesus. So in Jude 1, 14 and 15, who is the Lord that comes with his tens of thousands? Jesus. But in Enoch, it's the Holy Great One, the eternal God, who will tread the earth. So Jude, by quoting Enoch and ascribing to Christ, is telling you Jesus is the great Holy One, the Holy Great One, the eternal God, Son of the Father, companion of the Spirit. What more do you want? Let me just see if my cat needs to come in. So what more do you want? A short chapter, 25 verses, and he's got to mention the Trinity. Even a blind man who's honest can see the Trinity. Glory to the Father, Son of the Spirit. He's not here. Okay, now as you think about it, let me go to say hi to Muhammad. Okay, hey, Muhammad, how you doing? Right. Pay attention. Think about it. We got one, one more. I have to retire that session.
All right, so you see, right? Clear? Now, now that we got that, now that we got that, let's continue. Okay, horrible thought, yeah, I'm sure, the spirit. Okay, now, so Jude is quoting it. Now, it doesn't mean because he thinks it's canonical. It means that it has truths that were preserved in this book that Jude can quote authoritatively because those truths agree with the canonical books. Because Enoch is simply repeating Zechariah 14. Zechariah 14. What you find in the book of Enoch is already in Zechariah 14, verses 1 to 5. Jehovah my God, his feet will land and touch the Mount of Olives, split in half, and will begin raining physically from Jerusalem, and he's coming with his holy ones. Right? Everyone got it? So I can move on to the Genesis Apocryphon. Genesis Apocryphon. You may be able to find it online. I have an English translation. It's an Aramaic <clears throat> paraphrase of Genesis found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. You want to be shocked what you'll find in the Genesis Apocryphon? Do a search. Genesis Apocryphon. Okay. I have it, and I read that relevant part. Maybe next session I'll read it out loud for you guys. This is an Aramaic paraphrase. More like an exposition of Genesis found in the Dead Sea Scrolls, ancient. Did you know how they interpreted Genesis chapter 5? And you know how they interpreted a statement in Genesis chapter 6, verses 8 to 9, where it says, Noah found favor with Yahuwah. And notice Genesis 6, 8. You'll be shocked because this will blow your mind away. And actually, I did a session on this not too long ago. Okay. Genesis 6, 8 to 9. Watch here. Let me quote both of it. Genesis 6, 8 to 9. All right. You're going to be blown away. You ready? Genesis 6, 8 to 9. You guys ready? You sure you can handle this? You sure you're going to handle this? Genesis 6, 8 to 9. How the Jews understood, verse 9. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Yahuwah, Jehovah. These are the generations of Noah. Now, what does generations mean? It means genealogy. The generation of Noah, meaning the genealogy, right? Hold on, guys. I didn't even post it on the screen. What an idiot I am. All right, sorry. Gen genealogy of Joah, Noah. Now, watch here, Jen Badishu. I'm still waiting for that 20%. It's like, man, will this guy ever stop? No, I'm not. I'm serious, bro. You better be coughing up some dough with that money, bro. Don't leave me panhandling. Gas prices went up, dude. I want to phone rent. I'm going to have to sleep in my car. Anyway, these are the generations of Noah. The word generation also refers to genealogy, your lineage. Noah's righteous man, blameless in his generation. Noah walked with God. Now watch. Get ready to be blown away. They understood blameless in his generation, meaning that his Physical line, his lineage, his seed was not corrupted by the Nephilim. And in the Genesis Apocryphon, Noah's father asks his wife when she's pregnant, Noah, is that the offspring of the Nephilim? She goes, no, it's your seed. I didn't get pregnant by the Nephilim. You got me pregnant. So this seed is pure. So there is an implication. Because this is a chapter about the sons of God sleeping with the daughters of men. There is an implication that he's blameless in generation, meaning that it was his line that God preserved from contamination. His lineage, his physical seed was uncorrupted by the contamination of the sons of God. You, you guys understood what I just said? You with me there or no? Did, it, did I go over your head? Here, let me show you what generations can mean. Here it is. And in the Genesis Apocryphon, Noah's father tells Noah's mother who's pregnant with Noah, is that seed from the Nephilim? Did you get pregnant by one of the sons of God? Right? 
I should say sons of God. That's what I should say. Watchers. The word is watchers. Did the watchers get you pregnant? My apologies. Nephilim was believed to be their offspring. Is that seed of the watchers? Did the watchers get you pregnant? The sons of God? She goes, no, it's your seed. The watchers? Genesis Apocrypha. Guys, you can actually Google it. Put in Google, Genesis Apocrypha, Noah and the watchers. Now watch here. What does the word generation mean? Bible hub interlinear. Let's see. Blameless in his generations. Here's the word. Dor. Okay. Gen blameless in the generations. Let me watch it. Let me see if I can find the word. Yep. Age evermore. Generation never. Posterity. Okay. Yeah. See, posterity, your seed. See, posterity, your seed. Okay. Posterity, your seed. There's a lot of meanings to it, but in this context, his generations mean his posterity, his lineage. Right? Trying to find something more succinct. Let me find it, guys. Dwelling place. Come in your dwelling place. Yep. Class of men. Crooked generation. Especially a future generation. Present or past, right? Men of the living part. Apparently including both past and present. Usually of duration. Sorry, guys. Let me just. Period, age. All right. Generation. All right. Virus, urbis, periodis. Age old. All generation. Another dwelling. Every generation. Forever. Generation. Generations. Kind, see again, it can mean kind, your kind, comes from dur, right? So there you go. So it can mean your posterity, your kind. And in this context, means his posterity, his lineage from whom he descended, right? Just like, well, anyway, you get the idea, generations. You got the idea, right? And here one says, these are the generations of Noah. Here's the other word for generations. Generations of Noah. He was blameless in all his generation, blameless in among all his contemporaries, and blameless in his posterity, his kind. And when it says the generations of Noah, here's the word. Here's the other word right there. Toliduth or Toliduth. 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 Tolida. Generations. And it comes from the word. Galad, what does that mean? Account, birth, genealogical registration, genealogies, generations, order of their birth. So when you take these two words together, you can show it means that of all his kind, all his people living at that age, <clears throat> his posterity, his lineage was uncorrupt and blameless. So it's not just saying he was morally blameless. He was physiologically blameless. This guy. You shall you, you sword. Let me know when I should ban you. Be, being stupider than a Muslim pretending to be Orthodox. Because you dumb bastard. You're assuming the Nephilim in Genesis 6 were the sons of the sons of God. As opposed to being a group of giants distinct from them. Some think that the Nephilim were the offspring of the sons of God. Others say no, they were simply a human race of giants, different from the offspring of the sons of God, which is why afterwards you still have Nephilim because those would have been simply human descendants, human seed that were large in size. No, you're not hearing me. You're distracting me. Get out of here, dude. Get this filthy dirt bag out of here. So now everyone else who's listening, you got it? I can move on. So in the Genesis Apocrypha, it says, Noah's father says to his wife, she's pregnant, is that the seed of the watchers? Are you pregnant by the watchers, the sons of God? She goes, no. In other words, the Jews understood from the Genesis account that the influx of contamination by the sons of God was so widespread that people were now afraid that their wives were getting pregnant by the watchers. 
So here, Genesis 6, 9 is saying more than simply that Noah was morally upright. He was. But his posterity, his kind, and his genealogy was uncontaminated. So God preserved the line of Adam through Seth all the way to Noah, where he did not allow contamination to keep a pure line uncontaminated and preserve that line culminating in Jesus. Did we get that part so I can move on? Did you guys fact check me on Google? Did you check Genesis Apocryphon or do I need to do it? Where Noah's father is now wondering, are you pregnant by the watchers? You saw it, right? This is the Genesis Apocryphon. Aramaic paraphrase, commentary of sorts on Genesis found in Dead Sea Scrolls. Showing you how the Jews understood Genesis 5 and 6. Genesis 5 and 6. They understood it to mean that these were actual angelic beings, rebellious spirit creatures, who polluted, corrupted, contaminated human race by sleeping with women, siring hybrids, so God in his sovereign power, being almighty, preserved a pure human line, uncontaminated, and then eradicated and destroyed the rest of the seed because all of them were contaminated. Is it making sense now? Okay. If that's clear, we can move on. Yep. You got it, right? Lemmick. You got it. So you fact check me. See, I try to be as accurate as possible. And I trust Holy Spirit to perfect my ability, recall facts and scripture perfectly, and to obey it for the glory of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. See, you found it, right? There it goes. I wasn't lying. Noah's father wondered whether his wife got pregnant by the watchers. And she assured him, no, 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 no. It's your seed. Whew. All right. Woo. Poor Lemmick. Lemmick. See, I want to be 100% accurate to give you the most accurate information to be used by the Spirit to then perfect us, sanctify us, and empower us to grow in our knowledge, understanding, love, obedience, and worship of the Father, Son, Lord Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. So if that's done, let me now move on to the Didache. And am I, I may have to do Hamza later. Yeah, I may have to do it later. Everyone got it? So the oldest interpretation, as far as I'm aware, is that the sons of God were angels that corrupted, contaminated the human race. So God Almighty preserved one human line, uncorrupted, uncontaminated, and wiped up all the corrupt seed in the flood. You with me there? We got that? All right. And what do we learn? Even the consensus of the early church, the church fathers before Augustine and consensus accepted that these were demons contaminating the human race. What this tells you, now let me go deeper. You want me to go a little deeper? What is this telling you? This tells you that this was a satanic attempt of corrupting the seed of the woman so that there would be no pure seed of the woman because Satan in his mastermind wanted to have all human seed contaminated by demonic seed so there wouldn't be a pure seed of the woman that would spring forth to destroy his kingdom and crush his head. This was a satanic master plan. Since God said the seed of the woman will crush my head, let me now influence these angels to now corrupt, contaminate, pollute the human gene pool so they'll, there won't be no pure seed that will oppose me and crush my head. Got it? Ah. So what did God show? Satan, you are a creature. You're a dog on the leash of Jesus. May the blood of Jesus wash us, and by the blood of Christ, we crush you under our head. 
God is almighty over Satan, and God, being almighty, preserved a pure seed. Do you get it? So Satan wasn't bound up. The sons of God were, but obviously they were influenced by him. His influence and suggestion, hey, go down there. Look how pretty they are. Because Satan's not bound. He's still free. They're bound, however. Right? Adasti, you don't know your mother didn't exist because you are a whore born of a female dog, a whore, that the Shia molested and gave birth to you, a whore, because the Shia like to sleep with dogs. If I had a dog, I'd have him piss on you. Get the hell out of here, you filthy dog, you scum. Anyone who denies Noah, I deny you're human. You're worse than a bastard, worse than a dog. And no human gave birth to you, a female dog, whom the Shia slept with, gave birth to you, you filthy, dirtbag, son of the devil. <laughs> on you. Noah didn't exist. You filthy scum. That's the influence of William Lane Craig. Right? Noah didn't exist. It's symbolic. Your mother didn't exist. She's symbolic too because no human mother gave birth to you. You were given birth by a female dog in heat in a dog pound that the Shia found and slept with and did muta with that dog. <laughs> on you, you filthy son of the devil. Scum like you that destroy the faith of Christians. Sorry, guys. It's be, it's, it's be mean, be nasty, 2023. All right? All right, now everyone else got it? We got these facts. Is it clear? This is the influence of William Lane Craig, that heretic. May the Lord silence him like he does James White and Anthony Dodgers. These wicked Bible perverts who are poisoning the church with their false teaching. Lord Jesus, save us. Okay. So if we're done with that, can I move on to the Didache? And we're going to do Hamza Yusuf some other time. In fact, let me shock you guys. Lord willing, with your prayers, I'm going to be doing a live stream at 5 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, New York Time, Michigan Time. 5 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, New York Time, Michigan Time. There's a Muslim. I talked to him. He looks sincere. He wants to join me. 5 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, New York Time, Michigan Time, to talk about Islam and Christianity. Pray for that session. And for some of you, you'll be asleep. Some of you will be afternoon, evening. I will schedule it. Join us. Pray the Spirit will fill me and he's sincere. We can win him to Christ. And if you waste my time, I'll just address Hamza Yusuf. 5 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, New York Time, Michigan Time. Pray God gives me the health, alertness, the holiness to do it for the glory of the Father, Son, and Spirit. May the numbers increase for the glory of the Lord. Thank you for making these sessions successful. Let's end it with a Didache because I didn't get to that point. The Didache. Someone was talking about today, we fast from meat, Wednesdays and Fridays. Let me tell you why the churches that are ancient, apostolic, exhort their followers to fast on Wednesdays and Fridays. They get it from the Didache. Here it is, an English translation of the Didache online for free. Let me repeat why this is an important document. The evidence shows it was written around 50 to 70 AD within the first two generations, first generation of the eyewitnesses to the Lord Jesus Christ, written to the churches of the apostles, which they established by the Holy Spirit. And this is orthopraxy. It's telling Christians, Correct living, how to live. It mentions the sins to avoid, the virtues to cultivate, how to pray, how to fast, how to get baptized. And even says when you gather together to take the Eucharist, confess your sins. Okay? It's in this book that you'll find an explicit reference condemning pedophilia, pederasty, and abortion. Here it is. Let's read. Okay. Let me read chapters 2 and 3. Okay. Chapter 2. You ready? Chapters 2 and 3. Here's chapter 2. From the time of the apostles. This tells you what the apostles 
We're telling the church to do and not to do. The second commandment, gross sin forbidden. And the second commandment of the teaching, you shall not commit murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not commit, watch here, you shall not commit pederasty. Pederasty. Pederasty is molesting boys, not just girls. You shall not commit child molestation. Pederasty. Molesting boys as well as girls. An explicit condemnation of Muhammad and his trash book, the Quran, to the pit of hell that allows you to molest young girls. Okay? Watch here now. Is it right there on the screen? Hold on. Do you see that? Yeah, periasti. Now let's continue. You shall not commit fornication. You shall not steal. You shall not practice magic. You shall not practice witchcraft. You shall not murder a child by abortion. Nor kill that which is begotten. You shall not cover the things of your neighbor. You shall not forswear yourself. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not speak evil. You shall bear no grudge. You shall not be double-minded, nor double-tongued. For to be double-tongued is a snare of death. See, this is orthopractice. Do's and don'ts. Your speech shall not be false, nor empty, but fulfilled by deed. Practice what you preach. You shall not be covetous, nor rapacious, nor a hypocrite, nor evil disposed, nor haughty, proud. You shall not take evil counsel against your neighbor. You shall not hate any man, but some you shall reprove, right? And concerning, let me give you the rest of it. Concerning some, you shall pray, not all. Some you're going to pray, and some you shall love more than your own life. You don't pray for everyone. It calls a sermon. Okay? Chapter 2 of the Didache. Now let's read chapter 3. And I'm going to tell you why the ancient churches fast Wednesdays and Fridays. Okay? And where you get that practice from. This is going to be a long one. Okay? Chapter 3, Other Sins Forbidden. You with me, guys? Other Sins Forbidden. Let's read. My child, flee from everything, evil thing, and from every likeness of it. Be not prone to anger. Now, there is righteous anger. He's talking about anger that's not righteous. For anger leads away to murder. That's unrighteous anger. Neither jealous nor quarrelsome. Why do you think I block people? I don't debate people. Because we said don't quarrel with idiots and dogs. So I block you, morons. Nor of a hot temper. That I need work on. <laughs> Forgive me. All right. For out of all these, murders are engendered. My child, be not a lustful one, for lust leads with the way to fornication. You know what that means? No sex before marriage. You do not have sex before marriage. Neither a filthy talker, nor a lofty eye. I'm better than you. For out of all these adulteries are engendered. My child, be not an observer of omens, no witchcraft, no sorcery, right? None of that. Since it leads the way to idolatry, neither an enchanter, nor an astrologer, nor a purifier, nor be willing to look at these things. Don't even entertain them. For out of all these, idolatry is endangered. It's going to cause you to be an idolater. My child, be not a liar. Since a lie leads the way to fit, neither money loving. Brethren, God purge our hearts. Not to be afraid of not having enough money or lusting for it. Don't. Worship money and store it up and be penny pinching. And may I practice what I preach, please, Lord. Nor vainglorious, looking for fame, status. For out of all these thefts are engendered. My child, be not a murmurer. Don't murmur and grumble and complain, since it leads to the way to blasphemy. You keep complaining about God, then you're going to end up blaspheming God. Neither self will, what I want to do, what I feel doing, what I like to do nor evil-minded, for out of all these blasphemies are engendered. Okay, hold on. We're almost done with this section. So what are we supposed to be? What are we supposed to be, brethren? I have to look at the Greek. 
SB, can you stop being lazy? My sister, I love you. Go on, Google and put on purifier, what it means, because here it has to do with occult practices. I would assume by purifying me, like when you do yoga and meditation, emptying yourself in order to cleanse yourself of all that filth, which is not purifying yourself. You get what I'm saying, SB? My sister, for a minute, I thought your brother was about to unleash. Even though Didache says, don't be hot-tempered, you bald, handsome Assyrian. All right. So what are we supposed to be like? But be meek. Hope. Yeah, you, mister. Be meek. John Bedadishu. Since the meek shall inherit the earth. Be long-suffering. Be patient, Sarah. And pitiful. Show pity. And guileless. Don't be deceitful. Conniving. And gentle. And good. And always trembling at the words which you have heard. You shall not exalt yourself. Beautiful vices taught by the Lord, by the Spirit, through His holy apostles, written in the Scriptures and in the Didache. Okay? Nor grow overconfidence to your soul. Don't be so arrogant and overconfident. That's it. I'm super spiritual. I'm holy. God's gift to the church. I'm going to heaven. Your soul shall not be joined to lofty ones. Don't associate with arrogant, proud snots. But with just and lowly ones. Those who pursue righteousness and are humble, associate with them. You will have intercourse conversation with them because bad company corrupts good morals. The workings that befall you shall receive, right, as good, knowing that apart from God, nothing comes to pass. You get it? All right. Now, why do the churches fast on Wednesday, Wednesdays and Fridays? Here it is, and we're going to wrap it up. There's even a chapter on it. Chapter 8. If you ever wondered why your church, if it's apostolic, says fast Wednesdays and Fridays, here you go from this document. Takes you an hour to read it. Right here. I wrote a post. Muhammad, the fasting hypocrite, because the Muhammad was influenced by Jews, his masters, spiritual lovers, and the Hadith say Muhammad would fast on Mondays and Thursdays. I'm going to get you that article. You guys are going to get blown away. The Hadith say Muhammad would fast Mondays and Thursdays. Thank you, brother. Orphism. Thank you. Right? The Delphi Oracle, right? Yeah. Why? Because he learned from the Jews. It was a practice of the Jews at the time of the Lord Jesus they would fast twice a week, Mondays and Thursdays. You know why that's amazing? The apostles taught the churches, since these Jews are hypocrites who reject Jesus, you don't fast Mondays and Thursdays. You fast Wednesdays and Fridays. Say what? The Jews who reject Jesus because they're hypocrites, they fast Mondays and Thursdays, and we don't want to be like them, so we fast Wednesdays and Thursdays. But the Hadith, Bukhari, and Muslims say, Muhammad used to fast Mondays and Thursdays in imitation of the Jews. So according to the apostles, Muhammad is a hypocrite, damned hypocrite under the feet of Jesus. Here it is. But let not your fast be with the hypocrites, quoting Matthew 6, 16. For they fast on the second and fifth day of the week. Well, the second day is Monday. What's the fifth day? Thursday. Right? Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. They fast Monday, Thursday. So then what days should we fast? But fast on the fourth day and the preparation day. Friday. Fourth day is Wednesday. Preparation day was the day for Sabbath. Friday. This is where you get your practice of fasting Wednesdays and Fridays. Neither pray as the hypocrites. Like Jesus said in Matthew 6. So how do we pray and how many times a day we pray? But as the Lord commanded in his gospel, quoting Matthew 6, 9 to 13, thus pray our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, <clears throat> your will be done as in heaven, so on earth. Give us today our daily, right, needful bread and forgive us our debt as we also forgive our debtors and bring us not into temptation, but deliver us from 
the evil one or evil for yours is the power and the glory forever how many times should you pray this thrice in the day thus pray wait how many times the early Christians were taught by the apostles, repeat the Lord's Prayer three times a day. Why do you think I begin the sessions with the Lord's Prayer? This is a document at the time of the apostles given to the churches of the apostles, showing us how they worship, how they prayed, how they fast, the sins they avoided, and the virtues they cultivated. And so the ancient apostolic church prayed the Lord prayer three times a day. Why do you think I prayed when we begin the session? Now, is it a coincidence three times a day? Once for the Father, once for the Son, once for the Holy Spirit. There you go. I hope you learn. I hope you're blessed. I hope this benefited you. I hope, again, the Spirit used me. If I made mistakes, may correct those errors. I never repeat them and save you from them. If I spoke the truth, may confirm those truths that we know them, recite them, recall them, obey and live them out to prove our love for the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? Thank you. We had about 300. May the numbers increase for the glory of the Father, Son, and the Spirit. I hope you learn. Yep, there you go. Here's the Didache again. Read it, brethren. Takes you an hour. And apply it. If this is from the time of the apostles, and it is. I'll pop to everyone else. If this is from the time of the apostles, and it is, this is how the apostles taught their churches to worship, what to do, what not to do. Did you see it? In chapter 2, the apostles condemned abortion as murder and condemned murdering a baby when it comes out of the womb. In the womb, out of the womb, do not murder. It's murder. And no pederasty, no sodomizing boys or girls. This is the true faith. This is the true religion of the true God and his true church. Let us imitate them as we're filled by the same spirit that filled them and walk worthy of Jesus as they did, not for the praise of men, but for the glory of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Pray for me and my daughters. God grant us divine, miraculous, supernatural, physical safety, security, protection, and health. My daughters are in love with Jesus. Grow to love the Lord Jesus Christ more. And I'm a doer of his word, not a hypocrite. Loving Jesus Christ more powerfully by my deeds. The Lord, give me the discipline to stay healthy and keep the weight off. The Lord does a miracle bringing them. I'm with them every day. Please pray those prayers and finish the work in me to keep glorifying Christ until he summons you, until he returns. And pray for the financial provision to stay steady. May the Lord not allow us to panic, destroy our fears and doubts and unbelief. Lust of money and fear of finances, and we practice what I pre what we preach. Please, Father. Please, Lord Jesus. Please, Holy Spirit. Empower my throat and my voice to be used to glorify you and make us doers to practice what we preach. Save us from hypocrisy. Father, have mercy. Son of God, have mercy. Holy Spirit, have mercy. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come, come again physically and bodily. You will return, Son of God. We have no doubt. You are living you are our Lord. We belong to you. Seal us by your spirit. Fill us with your love. Do that for my daughters and loved ones. So we walk worthy of you and never shame you. Amen. Come Lord Jesus. In the name of the Father and of the Son of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus name. Maran Athe. Lord willing. See you 5 a.m. New York time. Michigan time. Eastern Standard time. Pray for that. There will be a fruitful discussion. And I'm not tired. But energized by the spirit. I love you for the sake of the Lord, and Jesus is in love with you. Take care.